بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على عبده ورسوله نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه من اهتدى بهديه واستنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته We're still in the chapter that deals with اللعان and اللعان is derived from اللعن and اللعن means to curse and we discussed this last time we met so we continue with the last hadith Hadith number 326. And I think the brother was assigned there. Yes, Akhi. Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu reported a man came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa from Bani Fazara and said, My wife has given birth to a child who is black. Whereupon Allah's Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, Do you have any camels? He said, Yes. He again said, What are their colors? He said, They are red. He said, is there a dusky one among them? He said, Yes, there are dusky ones among them. He said, How has it come about? He said, It is perhaps a way into which it has reverted. Whereupon he, the Holy Prophet وسلم, said, It is perhaps the way into which he, the child, has reverted. In this hadith, a man is in doubt. But his iman, his religion, is preventing him from clearly accusing his wife. And this is why scholars say that such questions do not pose as slandering. If a man goes to his wife and says that this boy is not mine, this is straightforward slandering. Either he brings the four witnesses, or he gives li'an, or 80 lashes in his back. There is no third, fourth solution. But the man's iman is preventing him from slandering his wife. He loves his wife. He knows her, that she is trustworthy. But, but to do, I'm white, she's white, and my sister's black. So the man is asking the Prophet ﷺ, and the Prophet is giving him the example from what he knows, from his experience. Do you have camels? The man said, yes. What colors? The red. Generally speaking, brown, red. So the Prophet ﷺ asked him, do you have dusky camels? And the man said, yes. These camels are colored different to the others. And then the Prophet told him, والسلام, where did he come from? This different color, where did it come from? And the man, because he is knowledgeable in camels and their lineage and where they come from and how they look, he said, oh, probably a vein reverted it. It probably a vein that reverted it, something that came back, meaning that in the lineage of the camel, somewhere in the great, 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 great grandfather, there was a dusky camel, and this only appeared now. So the Prophet told him, your black son might have reverted the vein as well. And by the way, this is normal. We see this all the time. We see that, subhanAllah, one of Allah's miracles and perfect creation, that you have people who are black, white, yellow, red, blonde, brunette, green eyes, blue eyes, black eyes, brown eyes. So you would find in a family, two or three generations having the same features. And all of a sudden, something is different. The man and the wife, they're all Caucasian, they're white, and they have a Chinese-like child. What? Where did it come from? He looks in the self in the mirror, she looks in the mirror, no resemblance. If you look, you will find in the fifth or sixth grandfather that he originated from the Far East, or he had Far East blood in him, and this affects. And that is why you have children, and some of your children may be white, and some may be dark in skin. They don't have the same features. So the Prophet ﷺ is cutting the line, cutting the road for shaitan, so that he would not come to you and start to whisper in your head, oh, this might not be yours, yes, you had a business trip to that country, maybe this took place, and you go and check your diaries, was it enough time to nine months, any, nine months ago, where was I? All of this from shaitan, and this is completely prohibited. A lot of the sisters call, saying that their husbands accuse them of things that are baseless. And I say, let the husband talk to me. And the husband says, yes, sheikh. And I say, why do you do this? My wife is behaving ill. And I investigate. So, investigating, the woman is a good woman. So I tell the man, Yahi, why are you dating your wife? He says, whenever I come to the house, she's on the phone. She said, okay, okay, I will call you later. She's definitely talking to a man. I tell him, are you crazy? 
all respectful women, when the husband comes in, if she's talking to her mother, she says, I will talk to you again, and she will receive her husband. You should fear Allah. The doubts and the whispers of shaitan is based on separating between man and woman, between a husband and his wife. The Prophet tells us, alayhi salam, shaitan erects his throne on water, and he dispatches his servants and soldiers. One of them comes and says, I was with this man until he stole something. He said, you did not do anything. Tomorrow he's going to repent. He goes, another one comes. I was with this man until he fornicated, committed adultery. Zina. He said, you haven't done anything. Tomorrow he's going to repent. The third one, he says, I was with this man until I made him divorce his wife. And he said, yes, you are the man. And he makes him sit on his right. Which means that it is a great and serious offense to separate between the man and the wife. And these doubts help in doing this. So the Prophet ﷺ is telling us, don't go with your doubts, don't go with such things. So this hadith also goes in line with the issue of li'an. Now, the following hadith, hadith number 327. Okay, the brother there. Narrated Aisha, Saad ibn Abi Waqqas and Abn Zumar disputed in a boy. Saad said, O Prophet of Allah, this is the son of my brother, Utba ibn Abi Waqqas. He told me he was his son. Look at how he resembles him. Abd ibn Zuma said, He is my brother, O Prophet of Allah. He was born on my father's bed from his concubine. The Prophet wasallam looked at the boy and he saw clear resemblance to Utba. He then said, He belongs to you, Abd ibn Zuma, and for the fornicator, nothing but the law. As for you, Sauda, you should cover up from him. He never saw Salah. May Allah be pleased with them all. Okay, this hadith is in an incident. In the previous hadiths, we spoke about li'an. And li'an is to separate, to dishonor, and to say that this child is not mine. Here it's an, a different and reverse situation. A child that is someone else, and someone claiming that it is his. What is the scenario? It's as follows. Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas, one of the ten heaven-bound companions of the Prophet ﷺ, had a brother by the name of Utbah. Utbah talked to his brother and told him about something that he had done in the past. What was that thing? He told him that the person by the name of Zam'a ibn al Zam'a happens to be the father of Sauda bin Zam'a. Who is Sauda bin Zam'a? The wife of the Prophet ﷺ. She is the second wife. The Prophet married Khadija for so long. When she died, he married Sauda. And she was in his age, alayhi salatu wasalam. So she was not a young woman at all. Now, Zam'a ibn al-Aswad had a slave girl, a concubine. And in the past, before Islam, anyone who commits adultery or pays a prostitute who happens to be a slave girl, and she becomes pregnant, and he says that this is mine. So she doesn't go and say that this is yours. He claims that the child is his, it becomes his. Utba told Sa'ad, that concubine of Zam'a ibn al-Aswad, I had an affair with, and she conceived from me. What happened after that? This is what we'll find after the break, so stay tuned. What happened was, that slave girl gave birth to a boy. Now, there are two parties claiming. Abd ibn Zam'a, the brother of Sauda, he said that this is my brother, because he was born in my father's house to his concubine. So this is my brother. Sa'ad ibn Waqas came to the Prophet and said, The Prophet of Allah, my brother told me that he made zina with this girl and that she conceived of him. And, O oh, Prophet of Allah, look at him. So the Prophet looked at him, at the boy, and he saw great resemblance of Utba, the one who fornicated. Then he gave the ruling, which is a rule that we follow. What is the ruling? The Prophet said, alayhi salatu al-waladu lil firash. The child that was born belongs to the bed. And the fornicator gets nothing except the stone. Meaning, he does not come out of anything. What does it mean? It means that when a child is born, who owns the bed? If she is a wife, then the child belongs to the husband, the owner of the bed. If she's a concubine, the child belongs to the master who owns the bed. And this fornicator, this man who committed zina, gets nothing except a shame, a stone, nothing. And the Prophet said to Abd ibn Zam'a, Abd, 
take your brother. Although he resembles Utba. Now, when he said to him, take your brother, meaning that the child is the son of Zam'a, as ruled by the ruling of the Prophet Okay, what about his sister, Sauda, the mother of the believer? The Prophet told her, as for you, Sauda, take cover from this boy. Though he is technically your brother, though he is the son of your father, but because of the resemblance and because there is doubt, we better be safe rather than sorry, and you wear hijab. You have to cover. You are the mother of the believers. You're not like any other woman. So take cover of him. This is the ruling that is applied all the time. And it's very important truly really, because a lot of the people nowadays are involved into zina, are involved into adultery, fornication. So people come. Shaykh, salam alaykum. We have a problem. MashaAllah, what's your problem? I was going out for 10 years with this girl. I know it's haram, I know it's zina. Okay, mashallah, why are you calling me? I said, Shaykh, after 10 years now she's pregnant. And I would like to marry her. Just to cover up. I say, this is not permissible. Why? Have you repented? Yes, we both repented. You cannot marry her. Shaykh, do something. Say, Akhi, marriage cannot be made and performed if someone is pregnant. She is not marriageable until she is not conceiving, until she is pure, until she is ready and repenting. So you cannot marry her, first of all. And she has to give birth. After that, after both of you have repented, you can marry her. Okay, Sheikh, what about the child? I'll marry her after a year, after she gives birth. But can I call this child my son? I tell him, what did the Prophet say, the fornicator receives a stone. You have no relation to that boy. This means I don't have to give him money, maintenance, allowance. No. Okay, can I give him my name? No. He's not. As long as he was born out of wedlock, you cannot claim such a child. And such a marriage cannot happen when the mother is pregnant. And this is a very serious topic. I know a lot, unfortunately, boyfriend, girlfriend, who have married in this condition. Their marriage is invalid, and the child cannot be related to the so-called father. When you open the door and you say, yeah, yeah, come on, get married, Malaysia, claim the boy, he's 22 years old. Claim him now, it's okay, it's always better late than never. And people would be encouraged to fall into sin, to have relationships. If she's pregnant, we marry her. If not, alhamdulillah, one year, two years and change, girlfriend, boyfriend, all of this is prohibited. Islam protects everything that relates to the family, to the reputation. If you slander a person by accusing him of adultery and you don't provide the evidence, you're flogged 80 lashes. If you speak about a woman and you say, oh, she's a prostitute, she does this, she does that. Her reputation is protected by Islam. Provide you for evidences. I don't have any. To be flogged 80 lashes and so on. So this is a serious issue that people should be careful in not falling into that. Do you have any questions? Masha Allah, tabarakallah. We start from the very back. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam. If a woman commits adultery and lies and curses herself in front of the judge, is there any forgiveness for her? Is there any? Forgiveness for her. That's a good question, but make it as a rule that you follow in all such questions. There isn't any sin on earth that Allah would not forgive those who come in repentance and seeking His forgiveness. What is the greatest and most serious sin on earth? Shirk. Even shirk. If the people come and ask Allah for forgiveness and repent and show remorse and never go back to it again, Allah would erase that altogether. This sin is similarly done. However, when she says such a thing and she wants to repent and she repents, does Allah accept repentance? Part of her repentance is to say that this child is not this man's, right? But if she says, no, no, I repent. I don't want Allah's curse to be on me, but I will not say that he is not his child. You are in big trouble. Not only that, by default, if the man still ignores that child to be his and is adamant not to confess that he's his because he isn't, in this case, the child would be attributed to the family of the mother. So if she repents in this case, and there's no harm done in the sense that the boy will not inherit his so-called father because he's not his father, in this case, inshallah, Allah will forgive her and would accept her repentance. Sheikh, nowadays there is a concept of uh, sperm donating wherein they prepare an egg, something, and they plant in the female. Okay? So is this regarded as zina or what do you want it? 
This is not regarded as zina as zina is defined by a specific conditions and among them that there is physical contact and not only minimal physical contact but full contact that is described graphically in the books of fiqh and I'm not going to go into that at the moment. However, what you're referring to is the procedure medically known, if I'm not mistaken, as IVF. And this procedure is not permitted between the two, the husband and the wife, unless the sperm is from the husband himself and the egg to be fertilized is from the wife herself. This is the only acceptable means. Sperm donation is one of the major and greatest sins because when you donate sperm, then the lineage would be all mixed up and those who inherit would not be entitled to inherit and it's not his child. And likewise, if what they call a surrogate mother is the one who accepts the egg of another woman and the sperm of someone who's not her husband to be fertilized and then she conceives a child. All of this is un-Islamic and it's called illegitimate acts, but does it take the ruling of zina, meaning that we can flog them, we can stone them? The answer is no. Allah knows better. Assalamu alaikum, Shaykh. Shaykh, in countries like India here, we have Muslim law and some people, let's say they fornicate and they say that they repent later and they say we won't get 100 lashes. So what is ruling for them? How do they repent and if they don't have Sharia? Allah Azza wa Jal loves that people says conceal the sins and not show these sins off. And we will get inshallah to the chapter that deals with prescribed punishment. But we all know the hadith of Ma'iz ibn Malik, may Allah be pleased with him, who came to the Prophet asking him to purify him and the Prophet ignored him والسلام, four times. He's not bloodthirsty, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. If he would have wanted to kill him, he would have done the first time. He comes to I fornicated. He looks the other way around. The man goes, I fornicated. The Prophet looks the other way around. Four times. And then he asked, is he crazy? He said, no. Maybe he had some intoxicants. Go and smell his mouth. He said, he's sober. He didn't take anything. And the Prophet is asking him again so that he would, and he maybe feel shy and retreat from his confession. Maybe you kissed her. Maybe you hugged her. Maybe you touched her. And the man said, no, no, no. So Islam protects. If a man comes to me and says, and a lot of people came to me and said, purify us. We have committed adultery. Uh, women ask the same thing. And we tell them, Allah wants you to conceive. Ask Allah forgiveness. Never tell anyone about your sin. Not a single soul. And repent and Allah will forgive you. End of story. So, in such non-Muslim countries, they are advised this advice. Even in Muslim countries, when they come, the judge would do the same to them. They would tell them, go back and cover yourself up. And if they insist and insist and insist, in Muslim countries, yes, they would be punished in accordance to the Quran Sunnah. Generally speaking, we tell them not to. Sheikh, my question is that uh, when the verse was revealed, my question is regarding the previous hadith, when the verse was revealed that those who accuse their wives of adultery or fornication, so this verse was revealed when the man was accusing his wife of adultery. So does this implicate that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was pointing out this man of falsely accusing his wife of adultery there by is, revealing it at this time? I understand your question. There is a general rule in usul al-fiqh which says al-ibratu bi'umum al-lafdi la bi khusus al-sabab. When something is revealed, what we learn from it is what the text indicates generally speaking, not in a specific case that it was revealed for. If you look at the Quran, for example, Surah Mujadra, the woman that came to the Prophet ﷺ and said that my husband, after all these years of marriage, he said that you are haram to me like my mother's back. So what to do? Allah Azza wa revealed the ayat, the verses, telling that if they want to go back to their wives, they have to free a slave if unable, fast two months consecutively, if unable, feed 60 poor people. Now, if someone now does it, we say do the same. If someone says, yeah, but this was revealed in Hulal ibn Umayyah, for example, or the companion that was specifically revealed for said, no, 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 no. The cause and reason is not specific. We take the evidence in its general context to fit all those who are similar in description to that. So this case, if someone slanders his uh, wife or he sees his wife cheating, this applies to him exactly because it fits the same description. This is all the time we have. Until we meet next time, Fiamanillah, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.